Tonight we have Kevin Martis with us, and he is the director of ICC, it's the Interstate Reform Citizens Coalition. And well, thank you so much. I'm surprised to see so many people. You'd think I was talking about the Book of Revelation or sexual rights or something, but it's just a plain old zoning talk. So I apologize in advance. I'll try not to make it too boring. Uh, hope it'll be interesting for you. Um, a little bit about myself, nobody really wants to hear about me, but I got started in energy policy stuff when I was a planning commissioner in Ragged Township in Lenawee County. Uh, wind developers showed up from Exelon at the time it was John Deere and UV, a German company, and asked us to amend our zoning to permit them to move forward. And at first I thought that was a reasonable request. They sent us up to the Thumb on a bus tour to go check out the wind turbines up there. We talked to some folks on our own. Some liked them. They turned out to have leases. Some hated them. Uh, they lived very close and were bothered by the noise, and some people didn't much care. Um, we came back from that trip saying, well, we don't see a huge advantage to the viewscape, the view shed around our property. I guess about all that's left is the money and whether or not we want the money. Um, in the end, our township decided they did not. They amended the zoning in a way that was strong, in a way that the wind developers did not like. The wind company put that zoning amendment on the ballot through the referendum process. They hired PR firms like David Axelrod's national firm and um, Truscott Rossman from Lansing, and they poured the advertising and so forth into our little township. Uh, despite that full court press of PR, our township voted in support of that strong wind energy zoning, 64 to 36 percent. Our surrounding townships likewise went through a similar process. Um, I didn't know anything about energy policy and never cared much about it until it showed up in my community. And then we realized it was time to do some research and to do our homework. Um, after our vote, we started getting calls from all around the state saying they're trying to build wind turbines in our area too. Would you come and talk to us about zoning? Because we're not sure a lot of the things the wind developers are telling us are accurate or a complete story. So. Um, that's how I end up doing what I've been doing for the last eight or nine years. People call and say, would you come talk to my community? So I'm not here to tell you all what to do with your community. That's up to each township. The great thing is under Michigan law, the supreme land use authority in the state is a local self rule township. And so you have in total authority to do whatever you think is reasonable with respect to regulating any land use. And wind is not a special case. You can treat them like any other land use, which will become clear as I talk. So I won't babble anymore. Um, so I am the founding chairman of the IICC. It's just our group is what we call it. It's really down to me and one other guy. Um, they liked my writing on energy policy issues in DC. They made me a senior policy fellow with this big fancy name that comes with a salary that's worth this much. So um, <laughs> I received no money from any of these efforts. I have a degree from the University of Michigan, but so does the Unabomber. Um, I already talked about my other stuff. I've worked on ag land preservation. Um, the wind ordinance that we created in Riga was added to a list of uh, model ordinances that the state used to maintain. So we're very proud of that ordinance. I hope when I get done talking about it, you'll understand what we like about it. And there's a link to it, but if you want to look at our wind ordinance at RigaTownship.com, it's right there under ordinances. I think it's a very sound ordinance. Um, so far, um, and I haven't done first-hand research, but we know that there are some wind leases in these townships right now. So that's where DTE has had some activity. I think there's not much in Quincy, but I did see one lease over there. But that's kind of what's going on uh, right now from the uh, leases that are recorded with the Register of Deeds. Um, so I'm not a lawyer, but I do watch Law and Order. Um, I'm not offering any legal counsel. And if your township's working on developing wind ordinances, make sure you have a very sound land use attorney because we found out there's a big difference. Uh, a lot of townships have really nice local attorneys who don't have a lot of experience with land use stuff. They do a lot of things like, uh, you know, land contracts and the things that we all have in small towns, but they don't do you know, uh, a lot of land use stuff, particularly when a Fortune 500 company is sitting on the other side of the table. I guess that's what got our attention more than anything. At one planning commission meeting in Riga, I said to the developers from the German company, look, if we don't amend our ordinance in a way that suits you, do you intend to start litigation with our township? And they said, well, we think that would only be prudent. We have 10,000 acres under lease. Well, it turns out they threatened and flew lawyers in through the whole process. And as soon as the ordinance was done, they canceled the leases and left. Threats of litigation are very common. 
Um, it offended me as a local planning commissioner to be treated that way, and it got my attention, and I've seen that pattern again and again and again. So I'll talk about that a little more as we go on. Um, but first, if you're a planning commissioner and you're dealing with zoning for wind energy right now, or if you're a community member, the wind industry and their advocates want to make these zoning deliberations, land use deliberations, a discussion about how noble, green, and beneficial wind energy development is. But that's not really what's at stake when we're uh, looking at uh, land use policy. The only issue before a, a planning board that's working on wind energy zoning is how to safely place 50, 60, or now even 70 story tall noisy structures into a rural residential environment. I don't care if these structures produce green electricity, extract oil or coal, or turn sow's ears into silk purses. None of that matters. From a land use perspective, we have a tall, noisy structure. How do we fit that comfortably with the human beings that presently live in that same neighborhood? We want to separate conflicting uses of land and protect health, safety, and welfare. Nothing more, nothing less. And I've sat on the zoning board side of the table. I know what it's like to have a wind developer ask you to grant them an easement over an entire township. And they want five people on a board to make those land use decisions for everybody in the entire township. That's a thankless task. Most of us, when we sign up for rural township planning commissions or trustee boards, don't expect to deal with anything very controversial except maybe a worn out fire truck. Now, in my township, we had a history of some other controversial land uses, including an ethanol plant and a nuclear waste dump. Well, everybody agreed we didn't want the nuclear waste dump. <laughs> uh, nobody agreed that we necessarily wanted the nuclear, uh, or the uh, ethanol plant. We got it. It's a half mile from my house. And then the wind stuff, nobody, in the end, the majority did not want. So, I know what it's like. It's not easy, it's not fun. Um, but I think if you look at the zoning regulations we put into effect in Riga, you can take a lot of pressure off your township board to decide whether or not the project moves forward. And that'll become clear as we talk about it. I think reasonable wind zoning regulations driven by two principles, consent and compensation, can place the burden of deciding whether a given community holds utility scale wind development on the wind developer rather than the zoning authority. That'll become clear as I talk about it. And for the record, if you Google my name, you will see uh, mainly environmental activists writing hit pieces about me, saying that I'm paid by the Koch brothers to stop wind projects, that I'm tied to the big fossil industry. Um, I'm not, and I don't know what else to say. I mean, they could say that I beat my wife, and I'd be just as powerless to prove that I don't. Um, I'm a remodeling contractor. That's what I do for a living. So the TV guy that interviewed me the other day asked me off camera, well, what are your ties to the fossil fuel industry? I said, I have deep ties to the fossil fuel industry. Oh, really? And he scribbled down those. And I said, yeah, as a remodeling contractor, I install a lot of asphalt shingles, and they're just tripping with fossil fuels. <laughs> <laughs> so Apex said in front of 500 people that I'm a paid lobbyist for the oil industry in Owasso last year. There's a database in the state. Go search my name. Um, so, like I said, wind developers like to sell communities and leaseholders on the economic advantage of wind development as a tool to gain approval for the projects. I don't really want to talk about the things on the next slides because all we really want to talk about is height, noise, setback, shadow flicker, the things that directly impact our land use activities. The wind companies come and talk about a long list of other things that in my mind are largely irrelevant to wind development, but if they get people biting on these, um, these baits, they will start to compromise on well-established land use policy principles. So I'm going to address some of those macroeconomic and environmental principles briefly just to know that there are answers to these things. But the first thing we've learned that is beyond dispute, and one of the roles that I have is I testify in front of the state legislature a lot on energy policy matters. And this is what we've learned. Michigan's wind resource is not competitive. This is Iowa. Iowa has a ton of wind development. These purple regions are very strong winds. And they go down into kind of these golden rod color areas here. You look over at Michigan's wind map, and you'll see our very best wind is around the tip of the thumb. Our best wind is Iowa's worst wind. That makes a big difference because the energy available from a wind of turbine is equal to the cube of its wind speed. Bottom line is we're paying twice as much money for wind electricity in Michigan as they do in Iowa. If we built all the Michigan turbines, including the ones in Breckenridge, in Iowa, they would produce twice as much electricity just by putting them in a different location. We have no economic advantage for wind development for our ratepayers in the state. That's beyond dispute. In fact, the reason they're building them here is in our last energy bill a year ago, December, 
they reinstated the in-state mandate for renewable energy. So to reach the 15%, all that generation has to come from inside the state. Unfortunately, it's unconstitutional. They don't have a right to use state regulations to restrict interstate commerce, but the only entities that have standing to challenge that unconstitutional act are the co-ops and the utilities. And the utilities have no interest in throwing that out. And I'll show you why. Here's our, here's since 1996, a list of all the power purchase agreements for wind energy that have been signed in this report done by the uh, wind industry. I've taken Michigan's wind contracts and superimposed them over the top. So you can see, when they were building wind in Ludington and up in the Garden Peninsula, we were paying $100 a megawatt hour plus. Some of the most expensive ever recorded in the United States in 2008, 2009. Everybody else, including the Midwest, was clustered down here. Now, you'll hear the wind <laughs> lobbyists say that wind is cheap and getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Well, it got cheaper until it hit here and it stayed pretty flat. Now, the price of Detroit Edison's wind has jumped a lot. We were down as low as $50 for company-owned wind projects like Detroit Edison's. As they got pushed out of strong wind source re resource regions, stronger ones like in the Thumb and back into northern Gratiot County, their costs have jumped back up to $60. I'll show you why, the, and you can see the charts there. It's where we started, they dropped, they dropped, they dropped. But you see they're still in the 50s. Now the next line will show that they're back up to 60. So wind energy is getting more expensive, and as the production tax credit for wind phases out, it will become even more expensive yet. And you can see these are contracts from Oklahoma offered into Missouri, $17, $19, $20. $20. So what about CO2? A lot of folks are very concerned about carbon dioxide emissions. Curiously, the wind guys don't talk a lot about CO2 stuff in rural communities because they know demographically most of us are Republicans and don't care about CO2 emissions. So they don't talk about it. You'll see the people from the big cities say, I want wind for uh, CO2 avoidance, but none of them want them in their city limits. Um, but if you're concerned about it, and I'm not here to say whether it's a valid concern or not, the people who support my organization, um, a lot of them are concerned about it, a lot of them aren't. I don't really have a final conclusion. But I know that the Obama administration said, look, if you look at sea rise and all the economic calamity that's caused by warming temperatures, they put a value of that on $40 per ton of CO2 emitted. That's a very wind-friendly, uh, global warming concerned administration saying it's worth $40 a ton, which is a very high price. So they put together the clean power plan. If some of you follow the news, you know that that was the Obama plan. This forcing the closure of some of our coal plants and so forth. MISO, our grid operator, did an analysis. Well, building block three of that plan is to build wind. They said it reduces CO2 emissions to be sure, but at a price of $237 a ton. Remember, the economic harm from CO2 is only $40 a ton in the first place. Our wind development reduces it at a price six times higher. It's six times cheaper to just eat the CO2 and deal with the fallout than it is to try and mitigate it with wind. It turns out replacing coal plants with natural gas plants, combined cycle plants, reduces CO2 for only $38. So, you take a look now at Branch County's wind resource and compare it to the thumb. And remember, the thumb compared to Iowa is really pathetic. Um, you got to ask, why here? Why are they here? Well, let's go back through a little history. Here's the tip of Huron County. <clears throat> Those green stars are where wind developments were successfully constructed. Huron County now has about 500 wind turbines in operation. It's hard to go anywhere without seeing them. Um, only a few local rural townships took steps to keep them out, and they did successfully. One of the reasons they got so much wind there is the majority of the Huron County Planning Commission members in 2008 and 2009 had wind leases, and they made sure the zoning was permissive. There's other reasons, but that's a big part of it. So, a year, now two years ago, three new townships, I think they're yellow, faced even more wind development by Next Era and Detroit Edison. I'm going to zoom in on just one particular township, which is Lincoln up here. Four out of five Lincoln Township trustees that did not have zoning had DTE wind leases. They were under county zoning. And even though they were going to make a lot of money when those turbines were built, they took action to remove themselves from county zoning in order to enact protective zoning of their own. They told the Huron County Planning Commission, you can look this up in the Tribune, we feel that Huron County has done our part as far as green energy. We feel that no additional terms should be allowed in Huron County. 
they were going to make the big checks. But they can look out their window and see what county-wide pervasive wind development actually looks like. And they said, even though we're going to profit personally, we're not interested in having this happen in our township anymore. Um, without getting too deep into the details, these three proposed projects, what happened is they had three, two county-wide zoning referenda and two township level, level referenda on the May 2nd ballot. So here's the folks fighting two Fortune 500 companies. It got really weird. The, the, the ad campaign got strange. They actually sent the president of DT Electric, not the CEO Jerry Anderson, but the, the, the DT Electric CEO, came to Huron County and they sent him up there to campaign for the project. Listen to what they said in their advertising. Dear Huron County residents, we know that some of you may be concerned about the number of wind turbines in Huron County and DT Energy is committed to addressing those concerns. I'd like to assure you that we will not ask for new wind development in the county. Voting yes on the county proposals just means completing the plan already approved. Basically saying, just give us one more and we won't do this to you again. Well, why would they say that if it's a universal blessing as the developers tend to lead us to believe? Well, what happened? It got even uglier. Next year is PAC that was affiliated with actually sent out this card that people got in their mailbox and says, why is this lawyer smiling? Vote no on May 2nd. Say, if you support your attempt to, to take back your zoning at the ballot box, we're going to sue you. That was their campaign tactic from next era. They never did sue them, by the way. Um, the Huron County residents fought back. They picketed in front of DT's Renewable Energy Center. Curiously, they were picketing. DT's linemen were driving by in their trucks, honking their horse and giving them a thumbs up. Um, we don't have money, only our voice. Vote no. Well, they were right. DT and NextEra spent $875,000 trying to get approval of those two projects. The local folks spent $3,700. Here's how it came out. 63% no. 36% yes. They couldn't prevail. Um, you can spend unlimited sums of money. Once people can see what pervasive wind development looks like in the township next door, that's the most effective anti-wind campaign sign I've ever seen. And wind losing at the ballot box, despite these massive campaign expenditures, is not rare. Here's now 15, 16, 17 townships. 17 out of 17 times wind has been on a township level ballot in the state of Michigan. And 17 out of 17 times it is lost. Even in Argyle Township, where Invenergy spent $164,000 in PR and handed out hats and t-shirts at the intersection of the streets on election day, um, and the people spent $2,700, they still lost. More than 40 townships in three entire counties have rejected wind energy, including Mason, Emmett, Schoolcraft. More are following soon. Most of Tuscola and Sanilac now are off limits for any more wind development. So why is DT in Branch County? They are here because the wind of your thumb has rejected virtually all future wind development. They won't take it anymore. The wind resource here is anemic. They know it. Can anybody confirm the proposing 600 foot tall turbines here? Has anybody heard them say that in the meeting? Anybody? Well, I, I haven't seen them do that except here. Apex is proposing 600 footers in the, in the northern, in, up around Mount Pleasant and Shiawassee County. I don't know what they're proposing here. For sure, I'd like to hear it from their own mouths, but the wind resource here is anemic. I'll tell you what they're really looking for. Am I biased? Sure, but I've watched this up close for a long time. They're looking for a wind-naive community that hasn't seen what's taking place in the thumb. The other reason they want to take you on a bus trip to Breckenridge is Breckenridge has unzoned townships under county zoning. The people have no recourse. I can take you to people's houses that are unhappy there but they don't take people to the thumb anymore like they used to because they get met by this. And you're not going to see that in Breckenridge. Okay. This one? Which had 60% said no. Right. Were those townships, had, had they acquired the lease on the ground? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So Absolutely. Yeah, well, and that's a question that I address at the end of the presentation, but the common question I hear all the time is, well, look, they've already leased this ground. They have these contracts saying that we're going to build these things. We can't zone them out now because we'd be violating their contract. Guess what, township board members? You are the government. 
and somebody privately signing a contract to do two land uses between each other doesn't obligate the government to do anything. If somebody came into your township hall and say, I got leases for 500 foot tall billboards all through the middle of your town, you'd laugh them out of town. They show up and say, but they spin and make electricity. Oh, well, we got to let you in. No, it's up to you. It's absolutely up to you. Private leases don't obligate your township government to give the private developer what they want. They want you to think that it does, and it does not. There were leases in all these places. So, another reason they're here is shortly after DTE lost, that's their CEO, they just lost, right? You can't build the windiest place in the state anymore. He announced we're going to build 6,000 megawatts of wind generation, even though we only have 1,500 on the ground in the state since 2009. He later reduced that goal down to 4,000 megawatts. It, it, I think, I, I don't know why he said that, except I know that he believes in wind energy. Just so you're clear, 4,000 <laughs> megawatts of wind energy at the rate of two turbines per square mile would take that much land. To produce 4,000 megawatts of wind would take about 2,000 turbines, 2,000 turbines, 2 megawatt turbines, and you would cover this much ground at the rate of 2 per square mile. Now I know they can do more than that, but on average, most townships get 50 to 70 turbines, so on average it works out to about 2 per square mile per township. So what? What's the big deal? Well, first of all, it will take you an hour to drive across it, but secondly, they want to replace one of their coal plants with an 1,100 megawatt gas plant. That 1,100 megawatt gas plant will have the potential on two, one or two square miles, whatever it says, to produce virtually the same amount of electricity on an annual basis as those 2,000 wind turbines would produce covering that much property. It's because the wind is intermittent and 4,000 <laughs> megawatts of wind is only going to produce about a third of that or less because the wind, they run out of energy, they run out of fuel all the time. So you decide, two square miles, or 1,000 square miles, which makes more sense. Not to mention 4,000 megawatts of wind turbine is hugely expensive, and they only last 20 years. So the reason DTE likes to build wind, and this came from the Public Service Commission, every time they get 100 megawatts of wind, remember, they're a regulated utility. DTE and consumers' ratepayers guarantee their profits on every power plant, guaranteed profits. They build a $220 million wind project, they'll make $125 million guaranteed profits over 20 years, and when the full production tax credit's in effect, they'll make another $80 million. So they'll make $200 million, plus you and I paid for the turbines too. So they can't lose. And as you can see, our wind energy mandate started here, and here's DTE's share price ever since. Wind pays. You'll hear environmentalists say, the only reason wind isn't getting built is because fossil fuel companies are trying to stop it. Oh no, they're doing just fine. Remember, the wind companies will make a lot of promises to you about iPad, iPads for every kid in your school, your school never going to have any debt, you're going to start to reduce your property taxes, all your roads are going to be paved. I mean, they but those are the kinds of things they insinuate all the time. Um, all, those, all that revenue that's coming to your community from wind was seized from ratepayers all around the state. So your local farm may profit, but the dairy farmer who's got DTE electricity coming to his operation is now paying higher rates. So it's just a way for a small number of landowners in a select few townships to basically tax all the other ratepayers and transfer that money into their pockets. Um, it's like this cartoon. The guy say, look, he's giving us all the money just like he promised. And the wife, always more clever, says he has your wallet. <laughs> There's no free lunch. So now let's dig into what the experience has been like with this wind on the ground. We got about 1,500 megawatts that's going up. Initially, the state recommended 1,000 foot setbacks and 55 decibel noise limits. It was not binding, but the state, the people also came in and said, here's what the state recommends. Turbines back then were only 390 feet tall. But all across the state, wind has produced a lot of heartache with recalls, referenda, lawsuits, etc., etc. Another thing we've learned is that wind energy is incredibly land use intensive. I already showed you that in another slide. But if you don't like nuclear power plants, this is the Fermi 2 reactor. I have a friend that works there. I'm not particularly anti-nuclear or pro or con any kind of energy. But if you wanted to replace that with nuclear and with wind energy, you can put two <coughs> turbines in every square mile inside that semicircle from Toledo, Detroit to Ann Arbor. That's how many it would take to equal the annual 
output of that one small, relatively small nuclear power plant. But you'd also need 1,100 megawatts of gas fire generation. Anybody who lives in Gratiot County will tell you in July and August when demand is high, the turbines often sit there and aren't spinning at all. So what's going to keep the lights on then? Gas generators, which is why Detroit Edison and another company are shoving 42-inch gas lines through Lenawee County right now because they're building new gas generators. Put it in another perspective, if one of your township gets 36 square miles of wind turbines, that same amount of electricity could be generated by a semi-trailer mounted gas turbine that would fit inside your average dairy barn. They're really big, but they don't make much energy, and that's because wind is a very energy diffuse source. It's a low energy density source of energy. All right, now let's get into the zoning questions proper. How do we evaluate any product? Let's say we're not talking zoning right now. Um, we need to know if you're gonna buy a new leg elevator, or if you're going to buy a farm tractor, or you're going to buy a new minivan, you got to know certain things about them. So it's easy with a car because we all have cars, or if we're a farmer, we have tractors or whatever. But we know a lot of things about them, and we know what our preferences are because of our experience. Some are international harvester guys, some are John Deere guys, et cetera, et cetera, price or Ford. But when somebody shows up like they did in my township and says, well, we're going to build some 100 meter class Vestas V100 turbines. 2009, we didn't know what that was, particularly because the only ones in operation were in Ubley, Elkton, and the two little ones in Mackinac City, and a couple of them around uh, Cadillac. That was it. So we drove to Ubley to go see them. So 494 feet, well, how big is that? Well, the top of the Mackinac Bridge Towers are 550, so they're that big. Um, and the 600 footers will be up here now. This is a V100 next to my friend's former home in Ludington. 1139 foot setback. That's 139 foot bigger than the old state guidelines. Um, that's what it looked like. That's the view from his backyard. The turbines made so much noise after they went into operation, he and his wife moved into the basement and slept in the basement. Doesn't happen to everybody, but it happened to a lot of people there. And they sued, and it took a long time. The turbines, they, the uh, consumers got sued by Mason County. That took years, and they've been running in reduced power mode ever since because they were out of compliance with the county noise ordinance. Um, and they ultimately sold at a 35% loss and built another house two miles outside the turbine complex. They were lucky. They had independent means and were able to do that. A lot of people don't have those means. Doesn't happen to everybody. So if you're a zoning official, we know that our guidance comes from the Zoning Enabling Act. The Zoning Enabling Act says a zoning ordinance shall be based upon a plan designed to promote public health, safety, and welfare. My phrasing is, if the proposed activity cannot be performed in our communities in keeping with health, safety, and welfare, it must not be permitted. Developers of any kind, their single commitment is to return on investment, period. I don't care if you're a condo developer or what you're building, strip malls, you just want to maximize your return. But that's not the Planning Commission's problem. Your problem is to protect health, safety, and welfare. Um, how far can I go with zoning? Until this wind project came up, I didn't have enough experience with zoning to even know what the full breadth and scope of our regula regulatory authority was. But zoning regulations to survive a legal challenge have to meet some pretty easy tests. They have to have a rational relationship to protecting health, safety, and welfare. They must not be arbitrary or capricious. That would be like saying Methodists can have pink houses and only one story tall, and Catholics can have four story houses of any color they like. Okay, that's arbitrary, that's capricious. And if you meet those criteria, your ordinance is virtually unsaleable, unassailable in court. Reasonable zoning is very, very strong. Developers will often try to bring this subject around to say that until you prove to the developer's satisfaction that you have peer-reviewed literature proving that wind turbines are unsafe, you can't put strong regulations on it. The truth is, you don't need peer-reviewed literature to establish your regulations. There's no such requirement. As long as it has a rational relationship to protect health, safety, and welfare, you're on solid legal ground. You're not required to be an engineer. You're not required to be an expert on all manner of acoustics and structural engineering. You're required to be smart enough to put together a reasonable ordinance that has some rational reason to put that regulation in place. If you go look at a lot of cases where zoning has been challenged in court, the plaintiff almost never wins. Township and county zoning is incredibly strong. Um, only the planning commission members have a sworn duty to protect health, safety, and welfare, not the developers. So, are the developers' profits more important than health, safety, and welfare? Increases in tax revenue, private property rights, we'll talk about that. Claims of green jobs or emissions reductions more important than health, safety, and welfare? 
On the Zoning Enabling Act, the answer is no. Uh, I'm going to speed this up a little bit. So now I'm going to talk about specific regulations <laughs> in general. Yeah. There's a long list of things we, that people want to regulate with respect to wind generation. We don't have time for that. But I'm going to talk about height, physical setbacks, and noise limits. And I'm going to throw in a little bit about property values. Those are the main ones. I don't know what BT has asked for, but in Huron County, they often want 500 foot height limits, 45 to 50 decibel at homes, 1320 setbacks to homes, 30 hours of shadow flicker, 1.1 to 1.5 times the height setbacks to property lines and roads. I haven't seen the proposal here, but that's common across the state. Most wind developers ask for that. Next Air is asking for 55, actually, and 1,000 most of the time. So, what are your rights or what are your abilities to do with respect to height regulations? from a zoning perspective. Well, you can regulate the height of a structure just on the basis of appearance. You don't need peer-reviewed science that shows a 70 square foot billboard makes people sick. The 60 square foot billboards don't. You can just say, we didn't want to see them bigger than that. Consider, how many zoning ordinances restrict private houses to one or two stories? That's common, 35 foot to the peak. I'm a builder, I see that all the time. That's not because you can't safely build a four or five story house. You just said, we don't want to see them any taller than that. That's your right. Wind turbines are no different. You can restrict their size for the sake of raw appearance. The shortest height distance, height restriction on wind turbines that I know that's been challenged in court in Michigan was in Bay Township, a case called Jonachek versus Bay Township. 35 foot height limit was applied to wind turbines. The wind developer sued. The George says, this is not an exclusionary zoning ordinance. You can build all the 35 foot tall windmills you want. <laughs> we regulate billboards on appearance. It's really funny in Isabella County, where they've given them no height limit for wind turbines in Isabella County right now. Their sign ordinance restricts billboards to no taller than 35 feet and says, you can't have any, get this, rotating or moving parts on the billboard. <laughs> but 60, 60 story tall wind bills will be just fine. And even Detroit Edison recognizes there's visual impact with wind development. This is Steve Rawlings, DT vice president, who lives up in the Leland Law Peninsula area. Sir, I'll just tell you all the photos you're taking. I'm going to put this whole video presentation online, so if you want to watch it later, you don't feel like you have to grab every frame. I'll also email it to you if you like. Um, so it's a big file. There's, I, I know it's like trying to sip out of a fire hose. It's a dense topic, and I don't. nobody wants to come back three nights in a row. Um, so I'll try and give you what we can. Um, so we caught Steve Rawlings in a podcast saying this up around Sleeping Bear. Certainly there are some pristine places in Michigan where you don't want to impact the view shed. You take a situation like Leland Law County or the old Mission Peninsula here in our region. Mm -hmm. Certainly there are areas where it just, while it would be perfect economic sense and perfect placement for utility turbines, we probably don't want them as a region there. <laughs> well, apparently Huron County is not pristine because they got a lot of them up there. The truth is we all love the places we live, right? <clears throat> Interestingly, wealthy regions in Michigan, like Leland and Centerville Townships in the Leland Law Peninsula, have adopted very stringent wind ordinance without fanfare or protest, despite a demographic that claims to heavily support renewable energy. It's the rural communities like us that have to pay the price for, I'm sorry, the eco fantasy of left leaning communities like Ann Arbor and Grand Rapids and Lansing. I'm sorry, I got a, left, a lot of left leaning supporters who support what I do. But, and I'm a Michigan grad, but if Ann Arbor's serious about reducing their carbon footprint, I want to see them ban night games in Michigan Stadium. I want to see them shut off the artificial ice in Yost Arena. I want to see Spartan Stadium go dark at night, right? I mean, why do we have to eat that? It's not fair. So how tall is too tall for your wind rate, for your wind turbines in your township? Just like any other land use, it's up to you. You pick. No argument, no hassle. And there's a lot of 199 foot ordinances out there on the books. Nobody's being sued. So, you'll hear the wind companies talk about industry standard for setbacks. I found a peer reviewed study that references these setbacks around the world. And curiously, Michigan is called out by name in this chart. <laughs> so, in France, it's a mile to a house. Manitoba, it's a mile. Um, U.S. National Research Council, or Germany, so you can read them here. Illinois, we said a lot of 1,500 foot setbacks, um, 10,000 feet in California, Michigan, USA, 1,000 feet. So what's the, from a house? So what's what's the industry standard? 
Which is the industry standard, right? Well, of course, here they're going to pick this one. Well, why don't we take a look at what the wind turbine manufacturer's literature says about setbacks. Vestas Health and Safety Manual says, if the thing should have an overspeed event, 500 meters, very 500 meters around the turbine must be restricted. That's 1,640 feet. Nordex says if the thing catches fire, nobody's permitted within a radius of 500 meters, 1,640 feet. This actually says must be evacuated immediately by running upwind. <laughs> Here's a 390 footer that failed in Illinois. And a debris field is about 1,500 feet. So what do you know? When they write those guidelines, they have a basis in science for them. Now, I quoted these two safety manuals. Right now in Huron County, they have a Vestas Health and Safety Manual from their latest crop of turbines. If, if you bring these up, BT will tell you those are outdated. And they don't mean anything anymore, even though those turbines are still in operation in the state. It, DT, or no, Vestas sent theirs to Huron County and said it's proprietary and you can't release it. If you do a FOIA request for that safety manual, which I've done, they won't give you the health and safety instruction manual, but yet you're duty bound to protect health, safety, and welfare of your communities. If you're writing a wind ordinance, I think you've got to require the full unredacted safety manual to be delivered upon application. So, January 23rd, 2018, when was that? Yesterday. This just happened to occur. This wind turbine slung ice off it into the school complex and it smashed the skylights out. <coughs> it was 11 or 1200 feet from the building. Well, the wind companies want peer-reviewed data from wind-friendly sources. They claim they will accept that. This is from the journal called <coughs> Wind Energy. It's published by these research scholars and it's from 2016. Very recent, fresh, peer review. So they took a look at throw events, rotor loss or ice. This is tedious, but it says, it is found that while it tips speeds of about 70 meters per second, in other words, under normal operating conditions, pieces of blade with weights in the range of seven to 16 tons would be thrown out less than 700 meters, 2,300 feet, for the entire range of wind turbines from tall to short, and turbines operating at extreme tip speed in an overspeed event may be subject to blade throw of up to 1.2 miles from the turbine. For the ice throw cases, maximum distances of approximately 328 feet and up to 2,000 feet are obtained for standstill. So the 328 foot numbers, if they're just standing there, you can only get ice drop. And that's what they'll tell you. They don't do ice throw. They do ice drop. And ignore the slide of the broken skylights, right? Um, and and 2,000 feet are obtained in normal operating conditions of the wind turbine, respectively. The ice piece is weighing from 0.4 to 6.5 kilograms. And then they make it clear, what's this document for? It's not theoretical. They say, the simulations can be useful for revision of wind turbine setback standards. This peer-reviewed paper published in a wind industry journal demonstrates that ice throw and component liberation are real risk inside of a range of distance from 328 feet for a standing still turbine up to 1.2 miles. I don't write the stuff. Nonetheless, wind developers keep asking for 1,000 to 1,400 feet from unleased homes. So here's the rub. <clears throat> this is a phrase that I coined. It's called trespass zoning. When you measure your setbacks from somebody's house next door, rather than the property line, which is typical of all other zoning regulations. I'm a builder. I gotta be five feet off the neighbor's property line or 25 feet off property. Not from his house, right? Why should that guy's location of his house determine where my house can go, right? I own the entire property, but not more. Well, when they ask for those setback <laughs> regulations and noise regulations we measure from the neighboring house, the wind developer, and this is critical, is in essence asking the regulatory body to grant them an easement or trespass privileges on unleased property. And I call that trespass only. That's a phrase I coined, and it appeared in an article that Senator Seitz and I wrote in Ohio. Wind developers don't like that phrase, and they don't like me calling it an easement because they say it's just a zoning regulation. But if you signed a wind agreement, like these people did with NextEra, part of it says, here's the effects easement. The owner grants to the operator a non-exclusive easement for audio, visual, view, light, flicker, noise, shadow, vibration, air turbulence, wake, uh, wake, electromagnetic, electro-radio frequency, any other effects attributable to the wind farm or activity located on the properties or adjacent properties over and across, blah, blah, blah. 
it's an easement when you sign a lease. So when they purchase it, they want to call an easement. But if they get your zoning board to donate that easement to them for free, it's not an easement anymore. I, that, that, that boggles the mind. So what's this look like? Well, let's say the developer's asking for a 1,320-foot setback for the house. This is not the scale. Well, we already know the evacuation zone is 1640 for some of these 500-foot turbines. You have a farmer with a lease and a farmer without, right? Well, let's say you move the setback distance to 1640 to the house. Well, that's an improvement. They did that in Huron County, by the way. If you look at the history of their zoning ordinances for wind, they've gotten more and more stringent. And after that vote, I believe they're going to write ordinances strong enough that the wind companies are not going to be able to continue to build there. But that hasn't been done yet. But even if you move that setback, that 1640 to the house, this farmer still has his property severely impacted from the, the effects of the wind turbine. Now, my <laughs> view, the guy that leased this large parcel may live in the next township. So this person's being paid for all the effects that only his neighbor is enduring. That doesn't strike me as fair or neighborly. The only reasonable way, and at least a minimum of 1640 to an unleased property line, is a bare minimum just from the industry published stuff. And you can certainly justify much bigger setbacks than that from their own published literature. You think, well, you made that up. No, here's an actual wind uh, map from a project that was abandoned in Bridgehampton Township, Exelon, same company that was in my community, tried to build there. So the gray parcels here are unleased. The green ones are leased. Zoom in a little bit. These orange circles, which are hard to see, um, show the 1320 setback distance. And if you zoom in on this farm right in the middle, you'll see that those circles cover about 50% of his private unleased property. I don't believe, if you interpret your zoning properly, that this guy's daughter wants to go into the farming business and build a house back here. You can't anymore. Some people will tell you you can. I don't want to argue about it, but I'm telling you a correct understanding of zoning law says you cannot. And he certainly no longer has the right to build a wind turbine in there because the two guys would sue him on either side for damaging the wind stream. So, I'm a libertarian. I think people should be able to do whatever they want on their own property, and nobody should tell me that I can't, right? Right. Well, the right to swing my fist ends where the other man's nose begins. I can do whatever I like on my property until it impacts my neighbor's right to do whatever they want on their property. That's the limit. I put a kind of snarky corollary. If my development project requires me to repeatedly punch you in the nose, I should first get your consent and then compensate you for your broken nose. The express goal of zoning regulations since the Euclid decision is to separate conflicting land uses from each other by putting them in different districts. That's what we've always done. But by establishing setbacks and noise limits from neighboring homes rather than property lines, the conflicting use, the stigma part of that use, is actually granted legal access to the neighboring property without consent or compensation. This is unjust. Now, wind companies will offer good neighbor agreements. I've seen them offer $100 a year. $500 a year. Next year, offer, Wind Energy offered $500 a year to the people in Argyle, while in Illinois they were offering $1,500 a year. Why can they do that? It's a take it or leave it deal. They don't need your consent to be able to build the project. So you're going to live with the things, so you got a choice. I take $500 or $1,000 and then I sign a gag order that says I'll never sue them, never complain about noise, I'll try to support the project. You can't get what your loss of amenity is really worth if the zoning measures everything from your house. So, developers don't like me using this phrase, trespass zoning. Curiously, there was a court case in the New York Supreme Court, which is not our Supreme Court, it's a lower level court. But the judge was looking at this very issue. He says, though the applicant, the wind company, has stated that the 1,750 foot setback exceeded the industry standard, right? It's even bigger than it needed to be. Such setback has impacted upon the use and or prospective use of adjacent properties of unparticipating landowners without their consent. The zoning authority gave it to them. Then he argues about the difference between a setback and a setoff. But anyways, the property then of the non-participating landowner is in effect taken by this governmental action without consent, compensation, or consideration. The non-participating landowner's property is therefore adversely impacted by the location of the wind turbines. Every other zoning regulation goes to the property line. Um, so what's the right setback distance for you to me? First of all, it's up to you. But I would think bare minimum for a 500 foot tall turbine, 1640, or better yet, convert that to a multiple of a turbine height for a couple of good reasons. Um, 
One is turbines are getting bigger and your ordnance will become irrelevant real quickly because 800 footers are out there on the drawing boards, 900 footers. I mean, when does it end, right? At some point it'll become obvious that a thousand foot tall wind turbine, a thousand feet from my property line, is just stupid, right? I mean, it's gonna get to that point. If you do a multiple, there's another good reason that you can't ever be sued for exclusionary zoning on your setback distance, right? They say, well, I wanna build 500 foot tall turbines and they got four times the height setback to the property line I can't build because there's a road every square mile. The defense is you can build all kinds of 50 foot tall wind turbines with a four times the height setback. Much smarter to have a multiple turbine height approach if you ever end up in court. Um, larger setbacks are now reasonable as well if you look at that peer review stuff. Another thing, and I won't dig into this much deeper, but if you're going to use, you can use distance instead of a noise limit. So the distance, you put a big noise, a setback distance in instead of regulating <coughs> noise. And if you're going to do that, maybe you need a mile setback or something like that. There's a good reason to use a distance instead of noise, because if you watch the court case in Ludington, and you see two dueling acousticians, one from the wind company, one from the community, arguing about terms like L-Max, L-90, L-10, uh, DBA, DBC, et cetera, et cetera, and then claiming, well, I was measuring that when it was at full power. The other guy says, no, you weren't. It's impossible. You'll go broke trying to enforce a noise ordinance like that. And Mason County has spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in litigation. Um, if you just put in a distance, anybody can go out and measure a thousand feet. You don't need an acoustician. So what I did in the RIGA ordinance, what we did, is we went four times the height to a non-participating property line. But for people who had a lease, we gave them a quarter mile to their house, 1320. You could make either one of those distances smaller with the signed consent from the neighbor or the guy hosting the turbine. So you could go down to 1,000 feet to your house if you own the ground and you and signed a waiver. And the people with, four, with unleased ground could become a participant in the project and also get the smaller setbacks. That's what I meant when I said, by using zoning like this, the wind company can only build if they get the neighbors to sign into the project, and then it's not the zoning board's fault anymore. You didn't decide for your whole community. The community decided for itself. You want wind next to you, then you have the right to negotiate your loss of amenity, which you don't have if the zoning gives them that easement for free. Equitable wind energy zoning should not forcibly donate unleased private property to the neighboring landowner's tenant. It's bad enough if it donated that easement to your neighbor Bob, but it's just donated to the guy leasing his ground. <laughs> That's worse in my mind. The two-stage setback is the waiver. I already talked about that. Now let's talk about noise. How loud is turbine noise and how loud is two, uh, and, and who do you believe? If you go on the Breckenridge tour, the odds are they'll have you stand underneath the turbine and you can say, I can hardly hear it running. That happened to me when I went up. It was in the summertime. Turbines historically make their most energy between midnight and 4 a.m. The odds of being there in the summertime and of being at full power are near zero, very near zero. Um, I can't say that they've ever feathered the turbine blades in anticipation of a tour. I can't prove that. But I can tell you that I went back to Ubley and stood at one in a thousand feet in a wind and rainstorm, and at a thousand feet, you didn't want to live next to that. So if you stood under a turbine and heard nothing, I can tell you this much, you did not hear it at full power. That's just a fact. Ask anybody that lives next to that. Secondly, if a guy tells you, I got turbines all around me and I don't hear nothing, find out their address, get on Google Earth and measure the distance. We have a wind technician in Isabella County telling township boards that in Gratiot County, I got turbines all around me and they're about a thousand feet away from my house. Well, we found his address, we got to Google Earth. His closest turbine is a half mile. People who live next to turbines who think they live very close to them often don't know. It turns out that from a half mile to a mile, the noise impacts drop quickly. Find the guys that live at a thousand feet. So, <clears throat> some of you are familiar with Big Bay Danak in the Upper Peninsula, the Garden Peninsula. Um, Heritage built 14 turbines up there. Those are the $110 megawatt ones, some of the most expensive ever signed in the history of the United States. 73 people living next to those 14 turbines signed this petition begging for relief. relief. People say they're at 13, 1400 feet, they're hearing them over their television inside. When guys will say, well, normal speech is 40 to 50 decibels. In my community they said that, curiously enough, wind turbines are as quiet as a quiet library <laughs> where we're standing. Well, technically that's true, but what they don't want you to know is that at night in your community now, on a summer night, you stand outside, you're only going to hear 20 to 30 decibels of noise. 
we got a very quiet community here like I do in Ragged Township. To take that nighttime noise threshold from 25 to 50 is about an eight-fold increase in the noise energy that you're hearing. And you say, yeah, but when the wind doesn't blow, the turbines don't make any noise. Not true. First of all, you hear the hydraulic motors, the pitch and yaw motors. Everybody I talk to says that you hear an industrial sound in your environment at night, even when the wind's not blowing. It's also possible to have times of wind shear where at the surface there's not much wind, yet the turbines are running near full power. Finally, you'll say, well, you've got the wind in your ears when it's windy out, you won't hear them. Not if you're standing on a protected deck or a patio or inside your machinery barn. I, I heard a guy from Minden City say, I got 12 turbines around me, I can't hardly stand to be in the machine shed anymore. All I hear is the turbine noise from all the way around. Not everybody reacts that way, but nobody in your township's having any trouble with turbine noise right now. So, what about wind turbines and health? I'm not here to talk about wind turbine syndrome. I happen to know the husband of the lady that wrote the book called Wind Turbine Syndrome. Uh, I don't talk about it. But if you want to ask me where can we get good guidance on noise regulations, I certainly think the World Health Organization is not Breitbart or Rush Limbaugh or some you know, fossil fuel funded entity who hates wind. They studied nighttime noise issues in Europe in 2009. They said, look, noise levels up to 30 decibels, this is an annual average out night, doesn't have much effect on human beings and their health. You get to 30, 40, some people can be disturbed by that noise. We all got a spouse that hell, the slightest thing wakes them up or whatever. But in general, they say the effects are modest. So anyways, in the 30, 40 decibel range, long term, not a big deal. From 40 to 55 at night, you see a sharp increase in adverse health effects. Exposed populations have to adapt coping mechanisms and vulnerable groups are severely affected. And above 55, a lot of people are being harmed. They say, well, one of the commissioners in here on county says, I called the hospital and said, how many people have you ever treated for wind turbine syndrome? Well, no, they said nobody. Well, see, they don't make anybody sick. Well, when you read what the symptoms are of exposure to nighttime noise, it's high blood pressure, it's, it's you know, restlessness at night. Well, how do you study that, right? I mean, you go in and report that. You, you may not even know that you're having those effects on your sleep at night unless somebody's studying it. Well, the WHO did, and that's where they came to these conclusions. I'll speed it up. George Hessler is an acoustician. He and his son do a lot of work for the wind company, but the state of Minnesota hired them to do a study on wind turbine noise. They built a lot of wind there. They said, for any new project, it would be advisable to maintain an average sound level of 40 decibels or less outside all residences. Well, I think it should be property lines, but the noise number is the right number. And even at that level, it does not mean it would be inaudible or completely insignificant, but most people would not have a lot of trouble with it. I agree with that. That's probably the right number. Acoustician Rob Rand looked at the Ragged Ordinance and said, I understand you're looking at 45 decibels at 1,300 feet. In New England, it's proven these noise levels are associated with widespread complaints, appeals to stop the noise, and legal action. Now, curiously, I testified in a hearing in Missouri, and I was cross-examined by four next era attorneys, and they asked me about this slide because I had it in my presentation. So next era in Canada says this. Now, mind you, they're asking for 55 decibels in Missouri, like they do all across the state. If you go to their website, Next Air Canada says the Ontario Ministry of Environmental Sound Guidelines for Rural Areas established maximum permissible levels of 40 decibels. That's what they built to in Ontario. They asked for 55 here. But they didn't stop there. They said that 40 decibel number is consistent with the standards set by the U.S. EPA. So the EPA agrees, and Next Era does not argue that 40 decibels, again, is the right number. Well, some friends of mine on the ground in Tuscola County, here on county, went door to door, started asking people, what's your experience with, with the turbine noise? Well, you see, there are a lot of people, the green line, much problem with them, but look at the distances. 1,500 feet up to 2,000, a lot of problems. The noise levels are in that 40 to 50 range. You get down into this noise range, you still get some, and sometimes that's due to the shape of the land the type of your structure, the low frequency noise a lot of times is amplified the walls of your house. If you're in a dished shape area or that kind of thing, all those things can focus and amplify the noise. It just depends. By the time you get from a half mile on out, most of the complaints are gone. So the 40 decibel number is the right number. Get them under that number and your complaints are going to drop harshly. I'm going to skip this one. It's too complicated. What Ragged did is we did a 40 decibel nighttime noise limit only at non-participating property lines. 45 decibel daytime noise limits. We added some low frequency noise protection, which is what that C letter does. Um, we consider that a compromise. You could waive those uh, limits as well by means of a waiver. Um, 
I'm going to skip this. It's too complicated. Now, briefly, I'll jump to property values. If the wind companies have been, and anybody in your community has said, I'm worried about my property value, they will hand you this. I think it's a law that says you have to hand the township this Berkeley National Lab study on property values because there's a conclusive statement in there that says there is no statistically significant effect loss of property values in our study. Curiously, Ben Hone, the author of that study, said in an interview, I think one of the things that often happens is that wind developers put our report forward and say, look, property values aren't affected. But that's not what we would say specifically. On the other hand, they have little ground to stand on if they say we won't guarantee that. We always say to wind developers, offer us a property value guarantee. If your study is correct, then put it in our ordinance, consent to that in our ordinance, and we'll protect your property values. If you can demonstrate a loss of property values, we'll compensate you and make you whole. What they will tell you is we're not in the real estate business. Yes, but most of you are not in the wind turbine business. By the way, um, there's three studies the wind industry has used over time, all showing essentially no loss. There's 11 major studies showing substantial loss of property values with proximity to wind turbines, some as high as 60 percent, 15 to 25 is a common range. Uh, one in the School of Economics, not exactly the Koch brothers, studied wind development in the UK, found 11 percent loss of property values. So what about this idea of exclusionary zoning? Wind developers will say this a lot. In fact, Detroit Edison has been saying it a lot, and our group is offended by it. We filed a formal complaint with the Public Service Commission about the repeated use of the phrase exclusionary zone, because it's a legal term with a very precise definition. We have a court case now that demonstrates that it's inappropriate to refer to strong wind regulations as exclusionary zoning. So, the zoning guidebook says, unless there's a demonstrated need for that use within a locality or region, um, if, if there's no demonstrated need, then you don't have to create regulations for it. Um, or if the use is inappropriate or inconsistent with your surroundings. You don't need to allow an adult bookstore next to an elementary school. Um, the court said if you want to ask the question, did you write an illegal exclusionary zone, you have to meet a number of tests. One, it has to be a lawful use, so you can't sell methamphetamines and say you've got to give me a meth lab in, in downtown because that's not a lawful use. I know some of you were hoping for that. Um, the use has to be appropriate. There has to be a demonstrated need. And for it to prove that it was exclusionary, it has to have the effect of keeping them out. So, next era sued Almer Township in Tuscola County last year. One of their claims was, the way you've interpreted your ordinance is so strong that we can't build, therefore it's exclusionary zoning. Guess what the federal judge says? The judge says, look, wind turbines produce energy, which is of course needed by the Almer Township community. But, next era's Tuscola wind project cannot reasonably argue that the township will have inadequate access to energy absent the wind energy project. Therefore, there's no demonstrated need. Therefore, I can't imagine of a wind zoning regulation that could be construed in a court of law as being exclusionary as long as you got electricity. That's the standard according to the federal judge. That's what offended us because just a month after this, their agents are telling people you're adopting illegal exclusionary zoning. All their agents are making this claims in the press. It's not true. The other thing is you'll hear DTE in particular, and others do sometimes, but DTE's been doing this a lot lately. They talk about the state of Michigan zoning guidelines for wind development, 55 decibels in 1,000. They're still talking about it. First of all, those guidelines, when they were in effect, were never binding on local rural communities. Those were abandoned by Governor Snyder a number of years ago, I think in 2010. And the current state policy officially is that there is no one-size-fits-all <coughs> approach for wind energy zoning. It's up to your townships. So if there's somebody's quoting the 2008 citing guidelines, you can call foul on them immediately. They're not operative and have not been for years, and they were never binding. Finally, as I'm wrapping up now, a lot of people say you got this 15% renewable energy mandate. The state says we got to build these things. Well, who's your state rep? Eric Blue <coughs> right? And your senator is Mike Shirt. Those two work to put this amendment into that energy bill. It's the only part of the bill that I like. And it, it made it. It signed into law. Nothing in this subpart <laughs> abrogates the powers granted to local units of government under the Michigan Zoning Enabling Act. Nothing that energy bill takes away your rights to zone wind turbines in any way you see fit. I asked Representative Lutheiser to come. He has a, conf a conflict with another meeting tonight. But he says, make sure the folks know it's up to you. By the way, lots of communities have adopted strong zoning. About 40 townships and three counties so far have written zoning that the wind companies did not like. They threatened to sue, like they did in my township, and 
I only know of one lawsuit that was uh, <coughs> directly on exclusionary zoning. The Elmer case was not. That was in Schoolcraft County, 3,900 foot setbacks. Was thrown out because Heritage didn't have standing. They never applied for anything. They threaten to sue a lot. Litigation is rare. In all fairness, DT doesn't spend a lot of time threatening litigation. Others do. Um, so let's wrap this up. Most land use changes are pretty benign, right? If you got a five foot setback to a property line instead of seven, all right, somebody's going to complain because somebody always complains, but it doesn't really make a big difference, right? But wind turbines are disproportionately large. This is not a subtle, quiet change to the nature of your community. We felt that the change was so massive and the impact so profound that they should not occur without the consent of all the impacted parties. Two stage setbacks with a waiver option for noise and distance require the developer to negotiate with everybody impacted. It's fair, equitable, and reduces community division. Remember, nobody ever came into your Madison Township Planning Board and said, the light coming through my windows is too steady, could you make it flicker? <laughs> nobody said, it's too quiet, could you raise it to 55 decibels from 25? Or my property values are too stable, could you build some 50-story industrial machines next door to put that value at risk? The bottom line of zoning is we were here first, we get to decide. That's the local rule zoning in a nutshell. As long as you're reasonable, not arbitrary and capricious, you have strong latitude to regulate wind like any other use, as you see fit. Um, I'm going to skip this. So, we have a number of townships in Branch County, some with township zoning, some with no zoning. What are your options if you're a township official? Let's say you found my arguments compelling and now you're concerned and maybe you don't want this project to go forward as proposed by the wind developer. That's up to you. But if you think the zoning recommendations I made are more reasonable, what next? Well, if you have township zoning and a developer's pushing now, you can adopt a moratorium. You put in place a one-year moratorium, six months, 18 months, that says we're not gonna take any applications for any wind-related developments. We're gonna take a time out and revisit our zoning ordinance. Perfectly legal, strong, the ability to enact a moratorium has been upheld to the Supreme Court in the Sierra Tahoe decision. Um, that takes the pressure off and your community can spend some time to investigate and develop zoning on their own. If you do not have township zoning, you do not have county zoning in Branch County, is that correct? There's no, okay. If you do not have township zoning and because you're not under another zoning authority, you can probably still adopt a mor moratorium and explore taking action to date back your own zoning into your own township. I know not everybody likes that. I mean, we got four unzoned townships in uh, Lenaway County. They tried to put a nuisance vehicle ordinance on the books in one of the townships that says, get this, you cannot have more than 12 abandoned cars on your property. <laughs> no more than 12. And the people went nuts and threw them all out of office because they wanted more than 12. <laughs> so I understand that libertarian spirit, right? But the bottom line is, you have full authority to, your board can just vote to create a planning commission and put it into effect and start to take control of your own land use policy. That doesn't mean that you have Big Brother breathing down your neck. You can do regulations on residential development that matches your growth patterns already. You don't have to put onerous regulations on anything. That's up to you guys. Um, so, what if you're a township resident and you're not a township board member? What can you do? Well, if you have township zoning, you can encourage your elected and appointed officials to act a moratorium like I asked them to do. Then you can work peaceably, please, with your PC to adopt resident-friendly wind zoning regulations. This happens all the time. I went to Owasso County and to Owasso Township, large township. They got an attorney at the table. They got a zoning professional at the table. I talked a little bit. They voted and say, let's recommend for a moratorium. They decided, we're not going to do this. No heartache, no drama, no big drawn-out fight. They just did it and it was over. Um, if your township, by the way, so let's say you encourage your board to adopt zoning for wind and you find it's too permissive. Well, you have the right as residents to place that amended ordinance on the ballot via the referendum process. And so you all get to vote on it. And that's happened many, many times. If you have zoning on your books right now and you're a township official that's permissive to wind, my advice, you're going to say I'm biased, but my advice is this. Rather than take it upon yourself to decide what 1,000 or 2,000 people want for land use policy with respect to these devices in your township. By just guessing, amend your ordinance and make it restrictive so the developers are not happy. Your people will put it on the ballot and then the people will decide whether they want restrictive or permissive. If they support the restrictive language, which 60 to 40, they will, because 17 out of 17 times that's what's happened. Um, at least you'll know that the people had a chance to speak. 
But if they vote against it, then you'll know the people have invited this development project into your township by a majority. And what I tell people, if you lose that thing, and you didn't want turbines, and now they're coming, but you lost, shut up. This is America. Majority <laughs> rules. That's the way it works. So, um, so, what if you do not have township zoning? Well, you can encourage your board to vote and create zoning. That's simple. Um, if they will not act, you have a right that you may not be aware of. You can petition the board to, to vote on the creation of a zoning ordinance township-wide. You need to submit petitions equal to only 8% of the people that vote in the last gubernatorial election. It's called Planning Commission Initiative Ballot. You turn that in, and then they will have to have a vote. This is happening in Isabella County right now, and it happened in Huron County. Um, if you win that election, then the board will have to appoint a planning board. They will have no choice under the law. What's the risk to you if you don't like this development? Well, the risk is you have leaseholders on the trustee board or something, which is pervasive. I tell you, every township that has wind development in it in Michigan has conflict of interest at some level in the process. That's demonstrable fact. Um, they help to appoint these planning commissioners. It would be my hope if they see that the board, the township, really wants a strong majority to adopt zoning, that they would then follow their lead with respect to what kind of planning commission they would adopt. That's a political question, but you do have that option. Last resort, I don't even like to talk about this, but you can initiate a recall process for officials who refuse to act. Nobody likes that. We're all friends and neighbors. I learned a long time ago in my township, never get in a political fight with a guy who's got a road named after him, right? You're never, you're never gonna win that one. Well, I don't like recall, but sometimes with conflicted officials who won't recuse and won't act, um, it's your only choice. We see people commit malfeasance of office, we see recalls. I can't guarantee you win a recall. The rules have changed, it's more difficult. I'd rather folks just get together privately, take a page out of the wind developer's playbook, meet with your trustee members over a cup of coffee and talk to them about it. Most of these people want to do the right thing. Most of them never face anything like this at the board level, ever. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Talk to them like human beings. Mm -hmm. Showing up at a meeting and yelling is counterproductive. Remember, you need that board to be swayed to your side, either way. And attacking them doesn't help anything, right? It's going to make them angry. So like I already said, we have a contract. We can't stop them now. Again, developers have no vested rights in your zoning ordinance until two things have occurred. And this is the legal test. Has that developer been granted a building permit? And have they actually started substantial exterior work? Until those two things have occurred, for any land use, they have no vested rights in your zoning. That's the trigger. Those two things. There's case law where a guy had the building permit, started remodeling inside of the structure, but didn't do the exterior, exterior things that the zoning permitted. That wasn't enough. Because he hadn't made any land use impact changes, the fact that he started construction on the inside was not enough, and he lost in court. So the, the, the zoning law is strongly biased in favor of the communities. So I'm wrapping it up now. My talk is based on the Ragged Township Wind Ordinance. It's available here at this, web, at this website. And that's all I got. You'll have this on YouTube? I will put the, I, if you just <laughs> type my name into YouTube now, you can see a lot of my talks. And when I get home, I will put, presuming the video comes out, I will put this on YouTube. And I'll post a link and let some folks know. This will be good to show. Well, I, I think that's a side they need to hear, yeah. you know, it's a perspective. And, and I know we had business cards or index cards for questions, but I think I feel confident to just take them here. Yes, sir. We don't show Correct. And we do have an ordinance for small individual That's correct. Yeah, and under under Michigan law, we have a permissive system, and so a land use has to have regulations for it in the community where they want to build. It can't just be built so because we, there's no regulation. Well, look, wind developers always, or almost always, sign contracts to build structures in a given township that are illegal to construct under the existing zoning. They do that all the time, and the point is to at least 200, 300 people, get them to come to the meetings and demand the change. But just because they signed a contract to sign something that wasn't currently legal in the township doesn't mean you have to make that legal. On the other hand, I would say this. 
wind is a lawful use of agricultural ground. And my advice would not be to just stand on your existing ordinance. My advice would be to create regulations, maybe like those I recommend, for that lawful use. And if you make them restrictive like mine is, I think they're fair, but they're restrictive, no doubt. People can put it on the ballot, and then you'll see. But, but, but if your ordinance is silent on utility scale wind development, that's not a blank check for them. Secondly, some people say, well, just do it under a special land use permit. And some special land use permit zoning ordinance language will say that um, in any other use not anticipated in this ordinance. That phrase is illegal. Right, but that special land use catch-all phrase is not legal. There has to be special regulation. Yes, sir. Um, I think the community needs to get together with an election board to have them do a special election Well, here's the thing. Well, I agree, and we all would like to have the ability to put a opinion question on the ballot, like you're suggesting. And we don't have that right under Michigan law. But a special election has to be about the election of an officer or a referendum or something like that. It can't just be, do you want to change our zoning to put these turbines in place? Other states have that. We can't do that here. That's why... Well, I... They're working on that in Ohio right now. Right now, the state decides. I agree. I agree. Well, I agree. But in, in the meantime, something should be done locally, is, is my opinion. In Ohio right now, the state decides the setback regulation for the entire state. And so there are big arguments about it right now. What I think we're going to see in Ohio, they're going to say, we'll give you smaller setbacks so wind can be built in Ohio again, because it's not been able to be built since they changed the setback distances a couple of years ago, unless it was grandfathered in. Right. Of course. Right. And what they're doing in Ohio to get around that state thing is they're going to say, look, we're going to leave the restrictive language in place for wind zoning statewide unless you have the positive affirmative vote of all the electors in your township to say, give us smaller setbacks. The board won't even be involved in. I'd like to see something like that, maybe, because. Um, I'm tired of running around talking to people about what their rights are under the Zoning Enabling Act. I've been doing it for eight years. And the wind companies won't tell you that we have these rights. A lot of township attorneys don't know that. I'm sympathetic with your position, and I would talk to Representative Luheiser and Senator Shirky about that. There's going to be hearings on conflict of interest again next month and under Gary Glenn because people are being harmed by conflicted officials who won't recuse. And it costs about twenty-five grand to sue them. It's, it's, we shouldn't have to be put in that position. Other questions? <laughs> I know other folks. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. conflict of interest regulations, the state level are so clear that every municipal attorney will tell the official you can't do this. Right now, some tell them you can't. Well, I agree, but we have also municipal attorneys that say you can vote all you want, it doesn't make any difference. And that's the whole problem in a nutshell. You call the attorney general's office, they'll say no. You call the MTA, said, well, within these guidelines, it's, I mean, that's, that's the problem. Conflict's a real problem. The attorney general has the authority to investigate and to act. And they won't, because there's so many cases of it, they can never deal with it. Other questions? But what's the uh, infrastructure to connect all these together to get it where they want it to go? It'll be buried cables, 34,500 volts from turbine to turbine until they get to a substation. From there, they usually go above ground with overhead. Now, I see some substantial transmission lines here in the town. That's one of the things they like because transmission is expensive. It's one of the reasons a minimal wind resource becomes attractive to them because they don't have to spend a fortune on transmission. In the thumb, they build a half billion dollar thumb transmission loop to get the energy out of the thumb. Here, they don't have to. 
the, many farmers who signed wind leases then sued and tried to stop the foam transmission loop because they didn't like it. Yes, sir. That situation, uh, Shiawassee County also told you that there's a Richard James that was going around in the South of the much like you are. You familiar with his work? He's a close personal friend of mine. I know Rick very well, all the way back to my ragged days. And I guess the thing. Did he work for one of the auto plants? Yeah, yeah. yeah I met him. I, yeah, yeah. I met him in, in Owasso. <laughs> so, anyway, I guess my point is that a lot of this low frequency noise is more harmful at lower decibel levels. It gets pretty dense in a hurry to understand, but I think the point is that at low uh, levels you can't hear, you can still have some of this. I think the science shows that. The wind companies will tell you it's a myth, that it's something they made up. And I don't want to argue about it because most officials won't understand it. They don't want to understand low frequency noise, LEQ, L90, L10. I scarcely understand it. You know, I'd rather talk about setback issues because that's clear to everybody, I think. But you're right. Low, we, that's why we added 55 dBC language to protect from low frequency noise because it affects some people rather profoundly. Other people doesn't. Just like some people get seasick, some people don't. Yes, sir. It's really got special devices now that put in offices. Yeah, there is. <coughs> right. One of the problems, of, one of the problems of low frequency noise is there's no effective way to mitigate it. It travels easily through walls and so forth until you get below grade. The waves are physically very, very tall. I mean, they, they, you know, when you talk about this wave length, it's meters sometimes. So. Um, it's, it's hard to use noise. The, the only effective way to mitigate wind turbine noise is distance. On a gas power plant, you can add mufflers and other devices. You can't do that with wind. It's not our fault that the only effective mitigation for noise is distance. And the other thing that's not our fault is that there's a road every square mile in the state of Michigan, virtually. I mean, one of the wind developers said to me, well, if you put that setback in, we won't be able to build. And I said, well, Doug, did I run around when you announced this project and build a house on every road in this township before you signed leases? Well, no. No, you didn't. Right. And I said, so I didn't do anything deliberately to make our township unbuildable. Those houses, those roads were there when you signed the leases, right? He said, yeah. I said, well, then your argument isn't with me. It's with Thomas Jefferson and the Land Division Act of 1797. Because when he created the Northwest Territory, he put a section line on every mile and we built roads on them. I mean, it's, the developer wants to shove a size 13 foot into a size 9 shoe. That doesn't mean you have to write zoning to make that permissible. But you can. It's up to you. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, could you address the problem with uh, heavy equipment coming into a uh, community and uh, wrecking roads and then the taxpayers pick up the bill? Well, it depends on the developers. Um, not all developers are the same. I will say this about Detroit Edison. Because they're a regulated utility and they're subject to a lot more scrutiny than the wildcatters that come in. In general, I have found them to be pretty responsive to road damage issues. Not all of them are. Um, some companies, like RES America and Apex, seem to be largely real estate speculators. They come in and lease the ground, get the local zoning approval, and never build the project. They flipped it to another builder. Another trap you shouldn't fall into is when you write your zoning ordinance, that's not a zoning ordinance for Detroit Edison. That's a zoning ordinance for any wind developer that comes to your community. So to presume that everybody will be pretty honorable, because I'm not going to be just nasty about Detroit Edison. They are a much more honorable company than others out there. That's just true. I'd rather not say that because they kind of make me mad. But anyways, that's just the truth. Um, but you can't assume that everybody will act in the same way towards your community as Detroit Edison. Once you write that language, any developer has got I had two in the same township. I think UV Wind came in because they heard Great Lakes Wind was leasing, and they said, well, if we hurry up and lease half of the township, at some point they're going to have to come buy those leases from us to make it viable. And it was a pure real estate play. That's happening too. Others? Yes, sir? Well, there is. You go to a site called Caithness, K C A I T H N E S S, K 
Caithness Wind something. It's out of the UK. They track all the injuries <clears throat> from wind, from transportation, heavy equipment, and so forth. Um, one of the most stunning things that I saw is two wind turbine technicians burned to death on top of a wind turbine in Europe. They couldn't escape. And one of the points I make is twice as many people died and that turbine fire has died in Fukushima. <coughs> but one is front page news. Obviously there's radiation and other problems. But, um, but yeah, people are being harmed and injured. It's primarily constructed. I have not seen any individual get hurt by a chunk of ice or something like yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. <coughs> Electromagnetic health hazards? Um, well, the most ordinances address it. I'm not clear on the science of electromagnetic impacts on people's health. I know some people are very concerned about it. It's not something I talk about. I will talk to you about radio frequency interference and electromagnetic interference with things like uh, precision farming. Uh, when I went to Van Wert, Ohio and interviewed some farmers down there, they were township officials with Iberdrola wind leases. They said it screws up all our GPS stuff and we hate it for precision farming. Um, we see a lot of uh, signal interference with televisions and cell phones. That's also true. So you will see that they'll recommend language that says electromagnetic interference, so that the magnetics, you know, is not putting distortion on your TV. But you really want to make sure you have RF interference. We have a Christian TV station on the edge of our township with a 600-foot transmitter. They paid for a very expensive signal study that showed the turbines proposed around them was going to cut their audience by 40 percent because of constant signal interference from the rotor pass in front of. They're about the same height. So it happens. Not everywhere, but it's an issue. But you can talk to people in the thumb that say, yeah, we have a lot of crummy TV reception. And what one guy did was he called John Deere at the time before Exelon bought him out. And they said, we'll bring you a satellite receiver and pay for that, but you got to sign a gag order. I said, well, I'm not signing a hold harmless agreement because you screwed up my TV. So. And wildlife. We got a question about wildlife. This is controversial. The wind companies will tell you that we're regulated by U.S. Fish and Wild Service with respect to eagles and bats and, and so forth. The truth is they're not regulated by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service can offer recommendations, but the wind company is not obligated to follow them. The poster child case for this is the Heritage Project in the Garden Peninsula. Look online. Fish and Wildlife sent them two strongly worded letters saying don't build on the Garden Peninsula. It's a grave risk to migratory birds, and they build anyways. So, that's, you know, so if you want to protect wild fowl around here, you can put that in your ordinance. Yes, sir, in the back. Have you had any, seen any cases where a township was unzoned has put in like an alternative energy standalone ordinance? Yeah, um, they tried that in Clinton County, mm -hmm. and uh, they put in a police power ordinance, police power regulations for wind development. They specified distances. Think hours of operation, a licensing agreement, and noise limits. Uh, Forest Hill Energy sued them, and the township's lost. Because the legal test is, if it walks like a duck, acts like a duck, etc., it's a duck. So, if you put all those things in a police power ordinance, you just created zoning without doing all the legally obligated things that you have to do to create zoning, like a planning commission, etc. So, it is possible to try again to just regulate activity, like noise, but I would say the odds of being sued are quite high. <laughs> What about deer? Um, I hear mixed responses with communities about the impact they have on deer. Some people say this scares them all off. Other people says I got a tree stand next to it. I don't know. I'm working the next week I'm going to the Upper Peninsula. They want to build 140 of them across the Michigami Highlands, which is all natural wilderness, the Pashiki Grade, all north through the Champion. Yeah, there it's going to be much different. You don't want to have 120 of these around your hunting camp. That's not why you go to the UP, eh? <laughs> yes, sir. Four hundred gallons. Just stand back and let it burn. That's all you can do. There's no way to put a fire out at 350 feet in the air. 
Um, the wind companies say they will work with your local firefighters to address this. But if your township is like ours, we're struggling to even staff a fire department. The regulations for training have gone much higher. It's become harder and harder. So the odds are if somebody gets hurt up there, the wind company's going to have to bring in the Coast Guard or somebody with a chopper. You can't go up there. Um, you know, I, I don't know about all that. Um, I know if you adopt regulations like I recommend here, your birds are going to be safe, your deer are going to be safe, your employees are going to be safe, your roads are going to be safe. You know. Any others? Yeah, um, one of the things in the uh, recent language, it says it's for wind development, but not limited to. And it also uh, says that they have the right to control the um, land underneath the turbines, surrounding the turbines, I would say how far around them, they are above the turbines, but they can build uh, power stations, they don't say what kind could be gas, could be nuclear, or just the big electrical ones and transmission lines and I'm kind of concerned that if they start building a lot of uh, wind turbines that the existing uh, high voltage power lines which ITC is a part of DTP are going to get more and more voltage and then the people that have those running near them right now um, and I measured the EMF underneath them, it's 14 times normal. Uh, and then to a half a mile, it's seven times normal. But they're even get more and more exposure to EMF. And I mean, you know, in other words, the cancer causing EMF in the community will increase with these things. That's my concern. Yeah, I've not seen enough studies on EMF and on those effects. But again, if you adopt regulations like I propose, so far the wind industry has never seen fit to buy enough easements. And if you're worried about that, at least under my scenario, you'd have the right to just simply not sell your easement to them so that you would be exposed to it. So I guess that's the best I can say. I don't think their leases, I, I know their leases don't permit them to build a nuclear or gas power generator on your property because that too would be subject to local zoning. And so they can't use that to just go ahead and build without township permission again. Yes, sir. Yeah, there was a wind farm uh, in Lafayette, west of Lafayette, Indiana. Are you familiar with it? Um, it was 6 west of Lafayette, Indiana, along the okay. Illinois Indian line. It goes 30 miles long. There's 176 turbines there. Uh, the guy that moves the grain piles down there says there's no birds, none at the females or nothing. He says uh, the people that that live down there says there's no country in the country anymore. And he says at night it's a twilight zone. People that live miles and miles away, it's blinking red lights. They can't go out on their deck and enjoy the evening. Just flashing red lights. And they said they didn't sign up for that, but it's, it's too late. We have to all pay attention if we're going to uh, try to get them. <coughs> the University, the University of Michigan paid a girl, Dr. Sarah Mills, to go do a study on Huron County and the phone and see what the responses were. The biggest objection everybody had to win at any distance was the flashing red lights. I was in Elkton one night at a dinner party and we stepped out on their steps. This is before so many were built. And I said, are those lights over there the ones in Ubley? And they said, yeah, 390 footers. I said, was that 10, 15 miles? No, 38. 38 miles. So people that think they're going to not see these effects because the turbine's in the next section over, I mean, the, the universal complaint is they all flash at the same time, is that I don't live in a, in a, a quiet environment anymore. I mean, but you know, some of the people from the state of Michigan who set those state guidelines, we FOIA'd John Sarver is his name. We FOIA documents from the MPSC. He wrote an email that says, rural people don't have a right to peace and quiet. Oh, I sent you the email. So, you know, that's, unfortunately, that's what we're dealing with. Uh, I'm gonna, you've had a couple, so I'm going to go to this fellow. Yes, sir. You? At what, what height is it going to become prohibited for them? they, they got to have 450 up now. They're going to want 477 to 495, 500. Um, anything they, they don't want to acquire sub 400 foot high turbines. And in this wind resource, they're going to need the low wind turbines, which have a small generator and big rotor blades. So that's, that, you know, so I don't know exactly what they proposed here. I, I don't know, but that's that's what they will have so to have. So 300 would be a good state. But they, uh, they haven't, nobody's built 200 footers in many years. Well, I can imagine you're talking about that, the tip of the blade at the top. Tip of the rotor. The, well, yeah, I got into it with our developer when I was on the planning board. In fact, they filed a complaint against me because I, I called him on the carpet. He says, well, these are only 100-meter towers, 100-meter turbines. I said, what is that in feet? He said, well, I don't know. I said, well, is that to the tip of the rotor or is that the hub height? Well, that's that's to the hub height. I said, well, 
then why don't you just call them two meter turbines because that's the height of the entrance door. <laughs> right? You know? So I pressed him again. I said, how tall are they to the tip of the rotor? I don't know. So I said, how tall did you tell the FAA were, they were on your application for FAA approval? And he said, 494 feet. So we did know. It, it's hard not to become passionate about that when you've seen that first hand. Can you go back to your slide which shows the map of Vance County and all the proposed sites? Oh, that's the very first. Yeah, like that's the yeah. second. Yeah. 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 Miracle. Yeah. So here's the place. So this is unzoned. Um, so which ones are zoned? Quincy has zoning, but like I say, right now there's only one piece there that I've seen. But sometimes they hold them. Once they know people are looking, they don't file them with the Register of Deeds anymore. Um, Bronson is unzoned, is that correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Union. And these have zoning. I was only able to see Madison's and Quincy's online. I've not seen Sherwood or Batavia. So if somebody can find copies of those, we can take a look and see what the regulations are. But they're not online. Yes, sir. One and a half to three acres is what they'll tell you. That's not counting substations. The, every every cluster of turbines, 50 to 60, is usually going to have a substation, take 15 to 20 acres. Curiously, here on county adopted wind zoning is an ag preservation technique. So you add up 450 turbines with one to three acres and all the substations, they've taken almost two square miles of ag ground out of production in the name of ag land preservation, which is roughly the same footprint as the city of Bad Axe. That's not ag preservation. Others? Yes, sir? I, I, I could be incorrect, but I thought that uh, people that's taken land out of production under the lag per, uh, Act Preservation, if one of these got put in, it changes the purpose of that land and now it removes the Act uh, Preservation. You mean like it. CRP or something like that? Yeah, where they're not, where, where they say, I'm not going to grow on this oh, land. That's a different question. I'm saying that they use wind development as a means to deter residential development in those areas, okay. rather than saying, yeah, I don't think the access roads and turbine pad would be subject to, you know, CRP. I, I just don't know what that is. about where the turbines are, if, if a farmer has land that the government pays them not to farm. Right, so set aside ground. Set aside ground. If these turbines go in on that land, it, it changes the purpose of that, and then they're not allowed to get that yeah. also. I'm not an expert on, on, on farm subsidies. I know the ground still is subject to PA 116 for wind. It is not with solar. If you cover a whole field with solar, forget your PA 116. What he's talking about is the conservation is CRP. I don't. I just. I don't know. Call your extension agent. Maybe. I mean. I, I can't answer that. I don't think they'd let you do that under a CRP contract <laughs> at all. I, I wouldn't think so. It's a not. It's a non-permitted use. No, your CRPs are supposed to be end rows and all your most unproductive ground, right? We all know how that works. <laughs> Anybody else? We've been in the room for a long. Yes, ma'am. one member has is uh, how will they afford, you know, hiring a zoning um, employee that can enforce this and, and they just don't, they have no interest in looking at anything. Well, that's really easy. Okay. Um, first of all, as a builder, I know that with every zoning application comes a zoning permit fee. So your zoning fees are able to be set so that they recover your cost of staffing your zoning board. Likewise, building permits. Well, we don't want to have our own building inspector. Well, you can use the state. And if you're an unzoned township, you probably don't have a local building inspector anyway. So you're probably already using the state. So there's no additional cost there. Your fees are likely to be the cost of creating the zoning ordinance, which would be somewhere between five and 15,000, depending on how hard you work on it and who you hire. If you require the lawyer a lot, it can be more. If you do most of the work yourself, it can be less. There's a lot of boilerplate documents out there. Secondly, um, what was the other question? Oh, the cost. Um, you got to have a minimum of four meetings per year for five commissioners. You only need four commissioners because one will be a board member and be the liaison. Because I also hear, we can't find anybody in our township to do this. How many people you got in your township? 3,000. Well, gee, Lincoln Township's got 600 people and they found five people to run their board. So there's all kinds of excuses because 
it's a new responsibility that people don't want to take on. Okay, I can't help that, but um, so the costs are not unmanageable, they're all recoverable, you don't have to raise taxes to do this. So, uh, oh, this guy, well, I'm going to go back to this guy here and I'll come back. Now, when you see uh, somebody from this position, I mean, where are they looking for? Do they specialize in doing that industry or do they just hire somebody with a building inspector to build a house? What do you mean to be a, a zoning commission, a planning yeah, commissioner? Commission. Those are just folks from your township. Those are just from folks from your township, and they don't have to have any special training. In general, it's nice if you find an architect and a school teacher and people from various, you know, a farmer from various parts of your community. So each stakeholder has some voice there is what you like to have. The more education, the more experience in other boards certainly helps, but it's not a requirement. So, back to you. Mr. Lundgren, I, I saw the plan for the study of the welfare board about the period of time. And I spent, when we created the uh, Zoning ordinance for the village, we use the, the water place out of the MMCC. Correct. I noticed at the beginning of the presentation, you suggested that someone who specialized in this type of ordinance for, for women to be involved. In yeah, I really do. And I, I, I know I'm biased in this respect. But our township is not getting the kind of representation we wanted. Once they started threatening litigation, our board had been to an MTA convention and heard some guys from Foster Swift, which is one of the premier municipal firms in Grand Rapids are in Lansing and all of them. And we had a fellow named Mike Holmier come down to our township. In truth, they hired him thinking they would shut his big mouth up on the planning board. Um, in the end, it turns out we become very good friends. Um, I would say I recommend Mike to everybody. I don't get any kickbacks. We got no financial arrangements. I don't get preferential access good. to him. But he's very good. He's done more wind ordinances than anybody in the state. Solid and has a lot of experience in it. And Foster Swift is hard to dispute their integrity. Um, they're, they're a really good municipal law firm. They're defending the lawsuits in Homer and Ellington Township and prevailing. Foster Swift, they will put your township in a strong legal footing. There are other good municipal attorneys out there, but that's the group that I am biased in favor of. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, there's like $175 billion for for wind and solar energy that our government, the Obama administration, has, has had out there. GE and BTE, they're they're making billions, getting billions of that money, right? If that dries up, if the Trump administration was to pull that, they wouldn't be even in the anymore, would they? Well, it's, it's... I mean, it's all about... Yeah, it, it is all about the money, of course, which is what a CEO of a company is supposed to be focused on, right? He has a fiduciary responsibility to his shareholders, so that's acceptable. But in Michigan, because we have a mandate, if the production tax credit goes away, they will, they, no, they still build because they have no choice but to build, even because though the cost will jump 20, 30 percent. Because we have to have 15 or 20 percent. No, irrespective of the cost. Now, there may be some kind of off-ramp in there, but the comparison is between a wind contract and the cost of energy from a new advanced coal power plant with carbon capture and sequestration, which doesn't exist anywhere on the planet, but yet they've determined that the cost of energy from that is $133 a megawatt hour. So as long as the wind is cheaper than that, it's going to get approved. MPSC basically rubber stamps these. Well, and solar, uh, biogas, methane digesters, there's a lot of options. Uh, biomass, I should say. But in truth, wind, out of all the alternative solutions, is the cheapest under this present tax regime. But the production tax credit is fading out, phasing out, and the cost will continue to rise. Yes, sir. say that your odds of any litigation here from a wind developer for, take, for taking control of your own zoning is almost zero unless you do something really stupid. I don't know Detroit Edison have ever litigated with any community. So the odds of a lawsuit are pretty low. The odds of them winning if you adopt some of the recommendations I went is zero. I've already seen that they failed the first test, which has demonstrated me 
Yes, sir. Talking about a lot of money that the television <laughs> companies have. How do you fight money? I mean, where do you get the money to fight them back? I mean, well, the great bad news is you don't need any money to fight them back. That's the thing. This isn't a legal battle. You just open up your Michigan Zoning Enabling Act. You go down to the section that says, I have the right to create a planning board. You say, all right, I'm going to pass this ordinance. We just created a planning board. Okay, it survived the 63-day period because your people would have the right to put that on the ballot if they wanted through the referendum process. But once you get past that 63-day period without a vote or you get through the vote and succeed, you put in place an interim zoning ordinance that's not subject to referendum and has the full effect of law immediately. And so there's nothing to sue about. There's no big legal fight with anybody. You just exercise your statutory rights under Michigan law. That's it. It's really easy. What's hard is the political argument with entrenched township officials. That's it. And I love township officials. I got a lot of dear friends in township government. But we all know that folks do these jobs sometimes for 30 or 40 years unopposed. That's the way it is in my township. Um, and they get set in their ways. It becomes a big part of their personal identity. For some folks, the, the jobs that we get on these township boards are the biggest things we do in our life. I understand all that. I love local township government and the people that do it. But it's complicated locally. Local politics is complicated. But that's where it's won. You need to persuade the people in the decision-making positions to make a change. Yes, sir. Kevin, I just want to confirm everything that Kevin said. I was the chairman of the planning commission in Reading Township. We had a win ordinance. And Duke Energy came to our township, asked us to change our ordinance to accommodate their needs. And uh, on the planning commission level, we, we did not do that. When we went to the board of trustees, they did accommodate Duke Energy, made the changes that they asked for, and we formed a ballot committee, put it on the ballot, and rejected it. We saw it on the list in our township, it was 71% that rejected Duke Energy's requested changes, 71% to 29%. It didn't take a lot of money, but it took a lot of effort. And I, I would recommend it. You be committed and you put that effort in. When, when I met with, as a chairman, the planning commission, I met with Duke Energy and was willing to make some compromises. But I asked them pointedly, what, why do you need these changes? And they said, if you don't make the changes, it's not economically feasible to put this project in. So, that's not that's not our problem. That's not the Reading Township's problem. We emphasized over and over that it was a matter of health, safety, and welfare. And that's what we stuck to, and that's, that's what we succeeded in. That's right. You guys were the champion for the biggest election results ever against win in the state until Sand Beach when it was 85 to 15 or 84 to 16. Yes, sir. It was high school. Yeah. That's a great question. Um, that's an important question because what they won't tell you in Breckenridge is that the wind companies have been appealing their assessments on all those wind turbines on a turbine by turbine basis every year and the Gratiot, uh, Tuscola, Sanilac, and Huron County have retained, uh, what's their name, a law firm. Um, and have spent $4 million so far in legal fees trying to recover the money, the tax money, that they're holding in escrow, that if they lose, they will have to return back to the wind company because they're arguing about depreciation schedules. So to your $4 million per turbine is what the value is. But they're subject, they don't pay school operating millage. They will pay any debt retirement or sinking fund obligations, but if you don't have those, they won't pay any of that. And they'll pay whatever township millage rate. So sometimes people say, we get these things in here, we can get rid of our property tax. No, you can't. You can't zero out your millage because then they won't pay anything either. <laughs> so, and I will tell you that many communities, even the U of M study says most communities that have wind turbines don't see visible improvements in their infrastructure as a result of them. And in fact, our studies have shown that most townships, if they would just add a quarter or a half mill road millage, would get roughly the same amount of money as they would by hosting turbines. You know, um, it depends on your millage rate, so I can't say that in flat terms. I would say counties, the counties make out better from the taxes than the townships do in general, unless you have a very high millage rate, which is why Gratiot County likes them, right? Because they got a number of them, nowhere near as many as Huron County. But the county government gets the lion's share. But I, I don't know. I, remember, they depreciate fast in the first five years. They drop 
70 percent in their taxable value. So the first couple of years, you might get 150,000, 200,000, and it drops pretty quickly after that. So, but it depends on your mill rate. I don't, you know, I would have had to done this, the numbers to show you with. So don't quote me on that. <laughs> I will tell you in general. What this does is taxes the people that live the most closely to them by depriving them of amenity of home in exchange for some landowners getting a substantial check and you get some additional revenue into your township coffers. I say it's more honorable to just raise the millage on everybody equally and get the same amount of money without the terms. I mean, you have that option. If you have a township that's short on money, it's because they haven't raised taxes. I don't like taxes, but you have the means to get the money you need. But people politically don't want to do it. Yes, sir. You mean like the price of energy or how much? How much energy is produced? I mean, if you look at the county, you get so many pounds of energy. Right. Pay so much. Okay, that's your investment. Right. Right. My guess would be these are going to be two 2.1 megawatt turbines somewhere in that range. They're going to run at about a 30% capacity factor, which is going to make them act like a 600 or 700 kilowatt wind turbine. And like I said in my presentation, the whole township full of them is not going to produce much different amount of energy, have much annual energy potential different than a semi-trailer mounted gas generator that you can put inside a barn. So, I mean, and the price of energy is quite expensive from wind. Well, well, remember, it's a two-edged sword. Utilities are supposed to sell the electricity back to us at cost. It's not supposed to be a profit center because they're regulated. So where does their money come from? From building power plants. So that's, that's a big chunk of the revenue stream. So what's great about wind for a regulated utility like Consumers of Detroit Edison is first, you got to get paid to build all these gas plants because we're phasing out of coal. So all the ratepayers are going to eat those costs with regulated profits on them over the life of the term. And if you build wind energy, it won't replace a coal plant because the wind doesn't blow all the time. So it drives up the cost on the gas plant by making it run less often whenever the wind is blowing. Yet you're also getting guaranteed profits on the wind project. Even the legislators didn't understand this until I told them that. Bottom line is wind plus gas forces the ratepayer to push two shopping carts down the aisle, one with turbines and one with gas generators, when you could get by with just the gas generators. So that's, that's the physics. Or coal or nuclear. <laughs> So, yes, sir. And then I know it's good. Let's take a couple more, and then if you want to talk to me afterwards, just come. Oh, yeah, there's a big pork plant. Come to find out what the cost is. Two major customers is medical and cosmetics. They make whatever for the cosmetics, and they're selling things to the brand. Same thing with our right? or some of these developers, they're coming in. The trailers are nice. I'm not coming to visit you, just so we're clear on that. Um, let's get to this one on the card, and then I'll take this lady's question. Um, what are some of the issues that make farming harder with wind turbines and wetland issues? Well, um, there are wetland regulations that the DNR and so forth can get involved in with there. We do see some examples of groundwater disturbance, but it's not been a big issue here in Michigan. The biggest complaints I hear about farmers, particularly out of the Iberdrola project in Van Wert, is that the developer would not work with the farmer with respect to siting the access roads and the turbine locations. Their lease gave them the latitude to put them wherever they wanted, and they did. So they cut 120 acre parcels up into irregular shaped parcels, which just drives up your cost. I mean, remember, if you get 10,000 bucks a year from a wind lease, you gotta subtract out three acres, probably, of, of revenue. If the turbine comes out in 20 years, because that's all the longer they last, you're going to get diminished yields in that area for a long time. You hear a lot of stories about crushed tile. Some people say it's harder to get aerial application done and so forth. I mean, so it's not all net benefit. If you get 10 of them, you're never going to get lose. If you get one or two, you know, there's some argument about whether or not what you lose is worth what you gain. I know there's a lot of leaseholders in Huron County that wish they had never signed. That's a fact. Yes, ma'am. 
oh, because of the compaction and all the soil disturbances, they go in and create the access roads, and when they tear them out, they're not the same. Remember, they, they bring in huge cranes, and they don't take them down the road. They go cross lots across the mile if they can. I mean, all those things have an impact. And sometimes we hear stories about the developer saying, yeah, I'm supposed to fix all your tile, but here, here's five grand. We don't have time to stop. Frost is coming. Got to get done. Whatever. So, yes, ma'am. Are you able to speak um, on the issue about after the 20 years, what happens to those tiles? Decommissioning. I didn't talk about it. It's important. It's in the RIGA ordinance. Some companies will tell you that the scrap value of the turbine will be enough to pay for the removal. Um, that's not true. We see too many rusting turbines all around the country that if they paid to tear them down, somebody would be doing it. We recommend that you put in your ordinance the requirement for the developer to pay for your township to hire an independent third-party engineer to put a projected salvage value on that turbine. We've seen numbers running between 100 and 100,000 and a half a million per turbine to decommission one. So if you don't have a bond or some other kind of guarantee, you could get stuck. Um, you know, we can't say that. Other developers, I would be much more leery of. Some will say, well, we'll just give you a cash guarantee. We are such a big company. Well, um, I can show you several large wind companies that have gone bankrupt already. Where's your cash guarantee then? Let the buyer beware. I would say always put in a bonding requirement, but even that's not guaranteed. Bonding companies don't want to pay out either. So better get ready to challenge that. Anybody else? You did say that. They would have a bond and then they could show this piece of paper to you that you want to see it at the time. And I think they, they do. They would retain any bond. Right. I think they will and they do. And if it costs them money, they're more inclined to do it because it's a recoverable cost at the ratepayer's expense. The more a wind turbine project costs, the better it is for Detroit Edison because the rate of return is higher. You see, it inverts the whole thing. So it's a little weird. Our install costs are 2.1 million per megawatt, and in Iowa, they're 1.3 million per megawatt. Well, if you gold plate your wind project here, you're going to make more money. Yes, sir. Even if you get rid of that power or scrap, what's that foundation look like with depth and so forth? Oh, 60 feet across, 15 feet deep, something like that, 30, 40 concrete trucks. And if you write in your ordinance a requirement that they remove the pedestal completely, they won't build. Yeah, because they'll only take, take, they'll only take down, well, they said six, six feet. Well, they do six. Below the surface. They always argued with and us. And then they covered up. Four. Yeah, if you tell them you want eight or ten feet out, they often won't want to proceed. And if you tell them to bury the cables deeper than four feet, they're not going to want to do that. That's just what I've seen in other hearings. Anybody else? Uh, it's getting late. We've been very patient. I'll be up here for a few minutes if you have any more questions. Thank you. Okay.